Welcome, everybody. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Steve Call. I am uh, a writer at The New Yorker magazine and president of the New America Foundation. And it is in both of those uh, guises that it's my pleasure to welcome you. The New America Foundation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute that invests in uh, new writers and big ideas. Uh, the New Yorker is a magazine that uh, has a lot of uh, poetry and uh, cartoons in it as well as uh, some great journalism by colleagues uh, like Michael Spector. Uh, thank you for being here today, and I am going to uh, turn the panel over to Michael, who will introduce our speakers and the subject matter. But please uh, greet them all now with a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I am, in fact, Michael Spector, and on behalf of The New Yorker and the New American Foundation, I'm really happy that you've come today. Turn off your, I'm, a, I'm required to say this by law, turn off your phone, uh, don't take pictures, don't scream, don't shout. Um, we're going to talk for about an hour, and then there will be some time for questions, and then there will be a reception afterwards, and where everyone who is not already in possession of Dan Jurgen's book, The Quest, can make up for it because it's a remarkable book and I will drone on about that more later. Um, we're here to talk about sustainability, a word, by the way, my notes are on an iPad because I wanted to be sustainable, but you know, glare is a bad thing in sustainability. So anyway, we're here to talk about sustainability, which is a word that I think threatens to become as meaningless and overused as the term green. Um, I, Usually don't know what those things mean, but I'll give it a shot. We have some really distinguished people in different but overlapping fields to discuss it. And I'm gonna introduce them. I'm gonna ask a question here and there, but I'm basically gonna keep my head down because these people really do know what they're talking about. Um, I'll start from over there. That man is Dan Barber. He is called the chef, which is like calling Yo-Yo Ma a guy who plays with wooded instruments. He is one of America's most innovative chefs. And if you've ever been to Blue Hill or Blue Hill at Stone Farms restaurants in New York in, in Terrytown, you will know that. It's, he's a brilliant chef, but that's not even actually his greatest talent. His greatest talent is to be a thinker about food and sustainability and how we grow food in a way that manages to feed us and not destroy the world. Um, he has won all sorts of awards, including two James Beard Foundation Awards for Best Chef. And in 2009, he was named to Time Magazine's annual list of the 100 most influential people. Uh, next is another Dan, Dan Jurgen, who's founder and chairman of Cambridge Energy Research Associates and is perhaps the most knowledgeable independent voice on the use, development, implications of oil and other energy sources that we can find. His book, The Prize, The Epic Quest for Oil, Money, and Power, won many awards, including the Pulitzer Prize. It was made into a PBS series seen by like every single person on Earth twice. Um, and his current book on energy and the remaking of the modern world, The Quest, just came out last month. And it's really remarkable. And you should read it if you read nothing else. And finally, Carol Browner, who many of you know and know about. She's a distinguished fellow senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. She was the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency during the Clinton administration, and I think served in that role longer than any person ever has. True? True. Incredible. At the beginning of the Obama administration, she was appointed the head of the White House Office of Energy and Climate Change, where she no longer is, and we can talk about that. Um, <laughs> and we will talk about that. Um, but they're really wonderful people. So. I think we should just be grateful that they came. And I just, I'm gonna start with just a couple facts. Um, and when we talk about sustainability, let's just say what we mean simply is the ability for humans to grow, to prosper, to live, to eat, um, and do it in such a way that it doesn't destroy the earth any more than we already have. So that we're actually doing some really um, significant things with fewer and fewer resources. That's not an easy thing to do, and it's particularly not easy because in the next 40, 50, pick your year, um, there are gonna be 50% more, peop more people on this planet than there are now. And those 50% will need to be fed. In fact, 
we'll need to grow more food in the next 35 years than all the food that had been grown in the world between the beginning of settled mankind in the year 1500. So we're talking about a lot. Um, and it's not just that there's a lot more people. They're going to be wealthier. Many of them will demand more protein, and that usually means more meat. Unfortunately, when people get prosperous, they eat like us, which is sad. Um, but it means more competition for land, water, and energy. It will only get worse as the effect of climate change gets more apparent. And of course, what's true for food is true for energy. Developing world countries consume less, and Dan can correct me here, and I think he already has, but um, they consume about a quarter of the oil that develop world countries have consumed traditionally. It's getting up to half. Pretty soon it's going to be equal. Um, as these people get richer, they drive cars. If you've been to India, you, over time you see this very clearly. The middle class does what middle classes do throughout the world, and those things are aspirational, and they are very expensive in terms of the environment. Now, the countries that are growing the fastest, China and India, are not countries that we can necessarily say, you know, you guys should really slow down because we've already destroyed the environment for 200 years, so we don't want you to have your turn. And that's a problem because when we talk about climate change and food production and all these issues, we're talking about global things. And one of the things I'm going to ask is, um, can we, what, what can we do? You hear a lot of people in America say, well, China's not doing it as if it would make it okay for us to just perform any sort of terrible um, environmental sin. And I don't think that's true. Um, so to, to start, Dan Jurgen's book, um, one of the many amazing things he says in, his, in it is that, um, you know, we now have a $65 trillion economy in this world. Possibly in two decades, we're going to have twice that. How are we going to get from here to there without using more resources, without taking more of the valuable water that is in rare supply, the oil, and without burning more fossil fuels than we do now, because we're already burning way too many by anyone's count. So why don't I just ask Dan that one, and then this will just be a, I won't ask specific questions of specific people. So just to, this is just to pick up on the theme. Okay. Yeah, you ju just, I'm curious uh, how you think we can possibly do that, because right. you're actually not a pessimist. Yeah. First, let me say thank you to both the New Yorker and the New American Foundation and to you for uh, this opportunity to be together in this panel with, with both my co-panelists uh, and uh, to kind of sort out this question of sustainability. It is, uh, as I found over the five years I was working this book, there were three big questions and they all kind of tie together with what you're saying. One is, what do you, how do you go from a 65 to $130 trillion economy? because people are not going to be happy being told that they can't grow and those countries are on a growth path. Uh, and indeed, just to, you know, to give the number, in 2000, the developed world used twice as much oil as the developing world. Today it's even, it's going up. And I think of all this kind of statistics that struck me when I was writing this book, uh, one of the most astonishing is that in going back again to 2000, capturing the change that you're talking about, there were 17 million new cars sold in the United States, less than 2 million in China. Last year, 17 million new cars in China, 11 million in the United States, and that 17 million is going to go up. So that is the first challenge. The second is uh, energy security in both its classic and its new forms. And the UN report last week about Iran highlights that. And then the third one, which is you're getting at, how do you balance the environmental with the uh, objectives, with the energy objectives, and do it in a, in a rational way? And so those are the, for me, are the kind of three big energy questions. Not a simple answer. Uh, we know renewables will grow, and they'll probably grow a lot. Uh, uh, we have a potential, I think, to be twice as energy efficient as we are today. But when you look at what's happening in the rest of the world, when you look at China and India, Renewables will grow, but so will, uh, they're on track to use more coal. So, it's, uh, so to me, the major changes in the energy system will probably actually come after 2030 because of the scale and the kind of complexity of the system. And so the next 20 years really will pose very sharply the questions you're talking about. One of the problems with all that, I think, is that these are political issues as well as environmental issues. And in this country, 
um, it's no secret that we haven't been so great on the climate. And in fact, this administration, a liberal administration with a majority in both houses of Congress, was unable to get a meaningful climate change bill through Congress, which I personally, and I'll bet I'm not the only person here, found somewhat disappointing. Um, Carol, did you, well. did you find it disappointing? <laughs> yeah. I'm not blaming her. No, no, I mean, look, I, I think that climate change is the moral and ethical issue of, of our generation. And, uh, you know, generations before have certainly left to subsequent generations difficult problems. The Cuyahoga River was on fire. That led to the creation of the EPA. You had cities that were so full of smog you couldn't see across a skyline. Today's the 21st anniversary of the modern Clean Air Act. I mean, we, we certainly have dealt with difficult pollution issues. Uh, climate change is not a difficult pollution issue. It is a planet-altering threat, and we are we could well be the first generation to leave to a subsequent generation a problem they can't solve. You know, running EPA, I had the opportunity to work with the best engineers, environmental engineers uh, in, in the world. Uh, once sea level rises start to occur, there's not an engineer in the world who can turn that back. And so my disappointment was obviously uh, quite significant. I was uh, very optimistic that we would be able to do something, that we would be able to set a cap on uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we would be able to find sort of the common sense cost effective way to achieve uh, significant reductions. Um, you know, politics being what it is, the health care bill took much longer, uh, ran down the clock, sort of ate up whatever goodwill there might have been in Congress towards some sort of responsible uh, energy legislation. But having said that, I, I, I am still, like, like Dan Jurgen, I am an ultimate optimist. I spend virtually every day now with young CEOs, with young companies that are figuring out new energy solutions. I was with 30 of them in London a couple weeks ago, today another 25 of them. I mean, the list of companies sorting through how we really change our energy future is very, very um, exciting. Um, I'm also, I, I'm encouraged by some of the things the administration is doing. I think it was a very important step that the State Department took on the Keystone uh, Pipeline just uh, last week. I think the commitment to cleaner cars, work that I began in the White House that is now continuing, Congress said get to 35 miles per gallon by model year 2020. We convinced the automobile companies to do 35.2 miles per gallon in 2016, and now the President is talking about 54 miles per gallon uh, in 2025. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the commitment the President has made on mercury, you may think, well, that's a neurotoxin, that's good, we shouldn't have mercury emissions from our coal-fired power plants. But the truth of the matter is, is if you set a tough mercury standard, what will happen is the 1950, 1960, even some of the early 1970 vintage uh, coal-fired power plants will actually shut down, creating opportunities uh, for some of the alternatives, probably natural gas in, in, in the near term, but ultimately some of the uh, renewables. I think the president will propose the first ever greenhouse gas emission standards on coal-fired uh, plants uh, at the beginning of the new year. So you may not have gotten the kind of comprehensive lay of the land that, that could have guided us for, for generations to come, but that doesn't mean important things aren't happening when it comes to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. I'll play the pessimist since you people are so upbeat. That's what I was going to have, right. <laughs> and Dan Barber is a person who lives sustainability on this farm. It's one of the most remarkable ecosystems I've ever seen. And everything has a place, nothing is misused, all the waste is recycled either to the animals, from the animals, into the ground in such a way that it's a nice loop. Um, it's a small farm, it's a beautiful small place. And my question is, because it's the same with energy, when we talk about there are solutions, there are wonderful solutions, can they be scaled up to deal with the problems of the world? Yeah, this is, uh, right. this is the big question about sustainable agriculture and the, the kind of food system that, that Michael's talking about, which is, which is really a movement, it's a social movement. And I would argue it's probably one of the most exciting, the most exciting happening today. Uh, and I'm lucky to be a part of it and have the opportunity to indulge in experimenting with it on this, on this Rockefeller, uh, old Rockefeller uh, farm. Um, I, would, I guess I would answer your question and sort of look, looking at the bigger picture from, from one perspective, which is, which is what feeds the food, the large food system, the big food chain. The big food chain feeds, while everyone talks about the exciting social movement and the, the regional, local, organic movement, it still only feeds about 6% 
of the population. So 94% of us are eating from an industrial food chain, whether that food is coming from California, Texas, Florida, or Mexico, or beyond is, is uh, indisputable. Um, the question, I think, for the future, and I don't really know how to define the future here. I don't, just like I don't, none of us can predict the price of oil. Um, otherwise, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, but the, the big food chain runs on, on essentially three things. And I'm, it's a little bit reductive. But um, the three things would be cheap fuel, um, abundance of water, and a fairly stable climate, which we've enjoyed for the last three decades. In fact, a UN report came out last year that said that since 1960, we've enjoyed the most stable climate in 2,000 years. Um, that was the Green Revolution from 1960 to 1980. It was essentially the Green Revolution. So we, the, the big food chain has been able to take advantage of some of these free ecological resources that allow food to be cheap, allow food to travel long distances. And my, I guess my position, I'm now all of a sudden I'm taking a position because I'm, I'm sitting here, but my, my contention is that uh, the future of how we eat is going to change dramatically because those free ecological resources are not going to be as readily available. Whether or not there's peak oil or peak water or peak phosphorus, or, at some point we're going to run into a situation where those, those resources are more expensive. And the cost of producing food in, in, a, in an industrialized uh, uh, regime is not going to be cheap. Uh, it's already not cheap on the environmental degradation issues. It's also not cheap on the health issues, as we, we've seen also indisputably. But I, from a pure economic standpoint, just the P&L of looking at this thing is like the inputs are going to be vastly more expensive. And the question, I think, why we're in such an important time is because we, we, we have a decision to make about the future. How do we transition gracefully into a world that cannot produce food with these free ecological resources? Uh, how can we look at the future, whether, by the way, whether this future is, is in our lifetime or our children's lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetime, is also sort of a meaningless point, I mean, a, a meaningless uh, question. It's, it's a blip on the biological scale. From, from a biological point of view, it's coming into our future. So, so the question is, how gracefully do we transition to a world where those free ecological resources are, are, are more expensive? And, and I think that's the challenge. I, from my perspective, and I, here I won't be the pessimist, I'll be the optimist, it's a nice challenge because if you believe that the big food chain is going to face these issues, and, and as we are seeing already, uh, not facing them well. I just came, uh, someone just sent me uh, the, the Pilgrim's Pride report that came out last year. Pilgrim's Pride is the number two uh, poultry producer in the world. Uh, the CEO uh, said that this year they've lost uh, $400 million, and they've lost $400 million, he said, because of the price of oil. Um, the price of oil is $96 a barrel. Um, uh, their predictions of that going very far north. The big food chain is built on, on $30 a barrel, not $90 a barrel, and, and not $130 a barrel. So where, so where does this go? So my feeling is it's going to go in the direction of more, by, by not because of chefs like me and not because of writers like Michael Pollan and chefs like Alice Waters, simply because of the economics, the war, we are going to look at a future of more local, regionalized food. And I believe that you will end up eating healthier ends. Uh, much more flavorful food because can of it. So there's can I ask you one point of clarification? You can ask me anything okay. you like. Uh, you the fact that I would be clar clarifying yeah. something for you is, uh, no, is ironic, no, but no, I'll, well, I'll, I'll you, go for you it. You use the word chain, so I'd like to use chain in another way. Yeah. So just to help all of us in the audience, yeah. all of us here. So you're 94%, 6%. So tell us wh which side Whole Foods is on. <laughs> and you're being recorded then. Yeah. Okay. Are I we being sponsored the is the question. <laughs> That happened to me last week. I spoke about Whole Foods, and I didn't know they were a sponsor. <laughs> Although there was a Whole Foods. Um, uh, just think of I, it I didn't know that I was putting you in a hot seat. Corporation. Sorry. <laughs> no. In well, no, I mean, they, they, Whole Foods uh, sort of toes the line. I mean, uh, uh, they, they, and they think they do it brilliantly. They, they are heavily invested in, in, in the industrial organic food chain, which is yet another way to look at this, is, is um, uh, the principles behind uh, sustainability. Uh, or let's say organic. Um, organic was founded 
um, I, on, on organism, on the whole gestalt. Um, we have, uh, to Michael's point, uh, if we haven't dumbed down sustainability yet, we've definitely dumbed down the word organic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so corporations take advantage of that. And I, I don't know that that means that, that, that Whole Foods is evil or, or, or off, in, off on the wrong track. I think they are uh, trying to bring to the world uh, food at a, at a price that, albeit expensive compared to the big food chain at this point, they're doing a good job and they're also supporting local farmers. So they, they have their hand, I think, in both. I don't know that Whole Foods is the vision for the future of agriculture only, only because of what I said. They too take advantage of the free ecological resources and when those resources are less, uh, are, are, are more expensive and less readily available, uh, it's going to be a different situation. Yeah. So can I ask a question? Oh God, please. <laughs> it must be that it's the dinner hour and we're all hungry so we want to talk to the chef. Um, 20 years from now, what yeah. we, most of us probably live on the, the East Coast, the Northeast Coast, 20, 30 years from now, what will Thanksgiving dinner be? Yeah. I think, I really believe Thanksgiving dinner will be a, a, a local, regional repast that will be more delicious. I really believe that. And I think the, the, the thing that's, the, the shiv here, it, again, is the economics of it. Let me, let me, let me just tell you. So what would that mean? What would, what, yeah, what, what would it be what, exactly? What would it be? I, what, I what, what are you eating? on my dinner table. Yeah, I think instead of eating, you know, a, uh, a, a pomegranate glazed turkey, uh, you'd probably be eating, you know, an apple and pear glazed turkey, which some people do now. Uh, but I think the economics of it are going to force you so to... So I'd still be eating turkey? Well, I think you'd be eating turkey. No, I, it's a you good question. Notes. And to take it further, I think you'd be eating, I think you'd be eating a turkey... Uh, you might not be eating uh, uh, two turkeys for a table of 12. You might be eating one because I think the turkey is going to be about 30 or 40 percent more expensive. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it more. I think you're going to be satiated more, literally. And, and I don't, you know, it gets in the realm of mm. philosophical, you know, what, uh, how do we enjoy food and how do we feel uh, uh, full and satiated. But I do believe that, and Mike was just telling me he's bought a, uh, a red bourbon turkey for his Thanksgiving table. He's going to pay 30 percent or 40 percent more today. Yeah. Uh, and I do believe that you're going to have a happier experience. And I do believe that you're going to eat a little bit less of it because I really believe that, that those flavors satiate you in a way that an industrial, uh, uh, big uh, blown up turkey is not. Uh, and if you uh, cook is it, not I think all those things. Well, it's not about the cooking. I, unfortunately, I wish I, I. Look, I have an ego about my my cooking. I have great cooking, but I don't think I can cook a a broad breasted white turkey, which is the industrial turkey. That's what ninety eight percent of our turkeys are going to be this Thanksgiving. Well, ninety eight percent is one breed of turkey that's essentially relying on those cheap ecological but, resources. But here's the thing, uh, um, and this is about oil and food and everything else, which we go into alternatives which is what you're talking about. And yeah, I bought a red bourbon turkey, and it's a heritage turkey, and it eats grass, and I have enough money to do that, and I'm a food fetishist, so fine. <laughs> but, you know, we're not, you know, when we talk about alternatives and we agree that they're good, or when we talk about alternative energy sources, and there's some extremely exciting things going on um, in what I and Dan and others have sort of called, this is an era of biology. It's not an industrial era. We're getting to a point where we're going to be able to make things biologically, and that means no fossil fuels. It means a lot of ability to direct what we're doing and where we're doing it. But it does hinge on this thing you said, which is money. Because as long as people can afford oil, and as long as it's there, right. they're going to get it, and they're not going to have the incentive. The, there's lots of solar folks out there, biology <laughs> people, wind people, and there's more and more, but they don't have the incentives that oil has even now. I, I think that, I, I think, no, 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 look, I, to make this very simple, yes, you know, we're all fortunate we can go out and we can get the ecologically correct turkey or whatever other piece of food we want for, for, for dinner, but I, I want to go back to something that Dan said about the, the sustainable agriculture movement, which is, is small, but I think it's real. I have a 23-year-old. He belongs to the local CSA. He only eats what he gets from it. He is looking at building a house that will be off the grid. And, and, and you know, I share that only because this is how young people are thinking. They do want to be in their communities. They do want to live a more sustainable life. And you know, I've been part of what was the green environmental movement, meaning go out and save land back in the 60s. Then it became the pollution movement in the 70s and 80s. And today it's the, the energy, the climate change movement. But something is happening with young people. And I think you, know, you, you were referencing that that is hugely important 
important about community because if we start to take our food from community, it will be a very different type of food we will eat and also the impacts it will have, broadly speaking, from an environmental perspective, from an energy perspective, will be very different. But I feel like we're talking about, you know, the Hudson Valley and Silver Spring, Maryland and places like he that. He lives in Vermont. And <laughs> I'm concerned about, you know, two billion people go to bed hungry every night. That number will probably rise. And I don't necessarily think industrial factory farming is the answer to that problem. But I don't think that a, a, a pasture-raised black Angus cow that farmers let go to 1,300 pounds, which I saw last week at, at a wonderful farm near where I have a house, that's l luxurious. But that's not going to be possible to sustain a life uh, just any life for these people. And my concern is where, like how do we go from, you know, we live in a country where our biggest health food problems are that we have too many calories, basically. And we well, I mean, also you have to think about it, you know, a few centuries ago, China and India were over half the world economy. After World War II, they were like 2% of the world economy. And now they're on a growth uh, thing that is just uh, phenomenal and it's, kind of changing many different things. Our most important relationship in the world today, to the United States, is, is with China. Uh, the energy system, I think, to me, the turning point was the year 2004, when the world kind of woke up to the fact that China was not just a source of inexpensive goods, not just a uh, competitive manufacturer, not just a lid on inflation, but also a huge and growing market. And that's when we started to see prices started to go up, to reflect what was happening. The only analogy to that was what happened in the late 60s and early 70s when you had the economic miracles in uh, Japan and Western Europe and the price of oil you know, happened to coincide with a war in the Middle East and with the crisis that we know, many, you know, that we know historically or know, remember. But, uh, but we're now at a similar point but even on a, on a larger scale and it's just transformative. And of course it affects food and all of it, but it's, it's this 20 million people a, a, a year moving from the countryside mm. to the city, okay. and they need housing, they need transport, they need jobs, and all of that requires energy. And they also need food which they increasingly can't grow because yes. they're living in the middle of giant yeah. cities. Right. Um, what about alternative fuel? Um, there's so much written about it, there's a lot of excitement. Do you think it can be more than a little bit of a blip of a health? without lots of subsidies or an enormous hike in the price of oil? Who, who's that directed to? Well, it was okay. to you, but I'm okay. willing to let anyone answer. Well, okay, I'll, I'll take it. So, um, I, the last part of the quest, uh, I have a whole section there trying to say where did this whole issue of climate change come from? And I include uh, Carol's famous exchange with Tom DeLay. <laughs> oh, <and, laughs> uh, verbatim <laughs> so uh, on, uh, on carbon, but it goes back to the uh, 1770s in the Alps. And then the section of the books followed is on the rebirth of renewables because we had a very immature technology that really went, as some in the audience may remember, into the valley of death in the 1990s and kind of hung on. And then this rebirth started. It started in Germany because of their feed-in tariffs. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the way I think about the renewable industry We've got to separate wind and solar. Solar may indeed be the ultimate answer. Cost has got to come down. Right now, solar is 0, 0, 0. 005 percent of our electricity. Wind is, you know, is much bigger. But the solar costs are coming down very fast, and so that can change. But so the way I think of it now is that renewables, unlike 20 or 30 years ago, uh, are a big business, but they're also a small business when you measure them against the scale of the overall energy industry. And what they are going to continue to need is to get to scale and to be competitive at scale to really be able to change things. But you look at China, if we just go back to it for a second, I had a discussion with one of the senior Chinese energy guys and he was saying that these winds in the Northwest, which are really fierce, he said, we used to regard them as a natural disaster. Now we regard them as a precious resource. Mm -hmm. And so they're harnessing it but you look at China, what they're doing is they're kind of moving on all fronts. But so it's going to be a uh, bigger business. But I think as we see now, you know, and kind of the, we've seen kind of a bounce back from it. I think 
in Europe, certainly, Spain is not going to be able to support solar in the way it has. So the, the fiscal problems of governments will uh, do it. On the other hand, we see a lot of momentum. And I'll just say I'm on the uh, Energy Initiative Board at MIT. And five or six years ago, there, were, there was no energy club. Now there's an energy club with 2,500 people in it. To me, that's very mm -hmm. significant mm -hmm. for the long term. You asked about um, government support. And I think that um, it, it, we have a long history in this country of supporting nascent industries through various tax policies, et cetera, through invest, direct investments and tax policies. We have been giving the oil industry tax breaks since the, I think, 1918 to the tune of today, $4 billion. That <coughs> continues today. So the idea that we're not going to invest in renewables, that we're not going to invest in solar, geothermal, wind, it strikes me as, as, as odd and certainly not in keeping with our history. Similarly, we've supported the nuclear industry um, since uh, uh, 1940. Um, Daniel mentioned um, the solar industry. You know, yes, these industries are tiny. They are growing as a proportion as a percentage rapidly. So for example, the United States was a net exporter of solar technology in 2010. Um, in fact, we exported even to, to, to China. Now, if we're going to maintain that, it's going to require some sort of government policies here in the United States that will give people who want to build the pa panels and want to build the turbines a, a market certainty. And what is that? It's a renewable electricity standard. It's a clean energy standard. Like you, know, you talk to any of the big manufacturers of renewable technology and what they will tell you is they are going to build it where they know they can sell it. And China is creating a set of policies that is giving them a guaranteed market, a guaranteed return on the investments they make in manufacturing. We can do exactly the same thing here in the United States. You know, we haven't uh, chose to, to, to do that thus far. Some states have chosen to do it, but certainly I think it's important. I want to say one thing about my debate with Tom DeLay. Tom DeLay and I got into this rather heated fight um, when I was running the EPA where he, he essentially says to me, you're regulating greenhouse gases. And we went back and forth for a while. And I, I finally said, I don't even know if the Clean Air Act, now remember this is the mid-90s, allows EPA to regulate greenhouse gases. The words greenhouse gases actually don't appear in the 1990 amendments to the, to the Clean Air Act. Uh, to which Tom DeLay said, well, you should write me a memo. You should do the legal analysis. Long story short, we did the legal analysis. We made a determination that if greenhouse gases endanger public health and the environment, then EPA had an obligation to regulate them. Uh, we sent the memo over. We updated it before I left office. The end of the story is there was a Supreme Court decision about three years ago embracing our analysis of uh, the Clean Air Act. So Tom DeLay probably shouldn't have asked uh, that question because it then forms a Supreme Court decision, which is how the Obama administration comes to regulate greenhouse gases uh, from cars, and that ultimately will lead to regulating greenhouse gases from all other uh, sources. But uh, this is one of these things of be careful what you ask for. Carol. <laughs> Here it oh, is. Yeah, the Supreme Court I wanted decision. To ask, I wanted to <laughs> and I have your quotes. <laughs> wow. That's great. Um, Dan Barber, for the, you know, if you look at water, which I think is instructive, we used to use an endless amount of it in this country. We still use a lot, but we don't. In California, they're extremely precise about the way they use water in crops. And a lot of that is after the Clean Water Act that mm -hmm. factories began to be penalized for using and abusing water, and they figured out ways to do it cleanly. Do we have to do that more? To, for one thing, can we talk about moving just in the food sector? 6% seems like a nice boutique number. Um, how do By we, the way, it was 3% 10 know, years ago. So, so the fact that it's 6% is a big, you know. I'm a, with you. Nice, it's, it nice is. And, and Apple computer used to sell 4%, and now they right. sell most of the laptops. But um, it can happen. Right. But, it this reminds me of, I, I'm sorry, is that the gist of the question? I didn't mean yes, to interrupt you. that's the gist. <laughs> sorry, jump on the gun. Go. <laughs> it just, okay, I, I was just reminded of a, of a conversation that um, I, I went to speak at a, at a conference in Europe, and I, 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 I was followed by Bill Gates. Um, Bill Ga we, I, I gave a, a, a little bit of a history and a, and, and a talk about what we were doing at, on, on, at the Rockefeller Farm and the Stone Barn Center. And uh, Mr. Rock, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Gates uh, uh, followed <laughs> me. By, yeah, watch that, watch that. Yeah. Uh, and he gave his vision of the future of agriculture and how to feed 9 billion people by, by 
by 2050. It was, a, it was a really interesting talk. I was waving my hand on the back, and I, I, I wanted to ask about these, these free ecological resources that I just, just mentioned to you. He didn't choose, pick me. Uh, but uh, we, we left the, I was with my wife, and we, we left the auditorium. It was very crowded. And we walked outside. And all of a sudden, Bill Gates passed right in front of me. My wife, being my wife, pushed me into Bill Gates to ask this question, because I didn't get called on. And I was walking up the stairs, and I got so nervous. And I thought, that, you know, this is my chance. So I turned to him as we were walking up, and I said, Mr. Gates, I'm, I'm really impressed with, with your talk and with you know, your, your thoughts about the future of agriculture and feeding a growing population. My question for you, and he really wasn't looking to, at me at all. He was like, boom, up the stairs. And we got to the top of the stairs, and I said, my question is, what's going to happen to some of these free, what's going to happen to your vision of uh, technological innovate, innovation uh, 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 hardy future? Uh, basically, he was uh, advocating for, uh, for genetic modification of seeds for the future of feeding the world. And I said, what's going to happen when these free ecological resources are no longer there to power your technology? And he stopped, and all of a sudden, 50 people around us with cameras. And, and, uh, and he looked at me and he said, what the hell is a free ecological resource? And, and I said, water, as an example. And he said, yeah, maybe, but I don't think of that as an issue because look at what's happened with drip irrigation. Have you ever heard of drip irrigation? That's what he asked me, and I, I had. And he said, do you know that drip irrigation has cut water usage by 85% in Iowa alone in just the last 25 years? And he went on to make another point. And actually, then he rounded, he, he didn't let me answer. He rounded the corner and he donated $10 billion to malaria research. So it's not like Bill Gates, <laughs> it's, not, it's not like Bill Gates is a bad guy or anything. But what I would have answered him, I'm gonna answer it now, and I'm sorry it took so long to get to it, but what I would have said to him is that, is that it's true about drip irrigation and it's an amazing technology and, and it's being used all throughout the world. It was developed in Israel in the 60s. But uh, what I would have said to him had I had the chance is that we didn't have drip irrigation in Iowa before 1968. There was no irrigation at all in Iowa before 1965. Why? Because Iowa was growing organic grains for the most part. And for the most part, the soils retained water when it rained. Mm -hmm. so, so it's an interesting way. Again, it comes down to sort of, you know, how do you look at this future? I mean, yeah, you could, you're right. There are technologies that are impressive and, and are important, and for some region of the world, critically important for the foreseeable future. But if we're really looking at the long-range view of this, we have to both have a historical understanding and an appreciation for some of the real challenges we face with these, with these, these free services. When I was um, secretary, before I was at EPA, I was I'm from Florida. I was born and raised there. I was secretary of the environment for the state of Florida. Um, now, our economy in Florida is a tourism-based economy, so it's essentially based on clean water. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the agricultural producers in the state still did not meter, I'm not saying pay for, meter their water use. They were wow. free to yeah. sink a well and use whatever water they thought important. Wow. Uh, the draining of South Florida for development, uh, the damage that's been done to the, the, the Everglades uh, system, we literally take fresh water and put it out to tide in Florida. Now we're trying to reverse that, and, and it struck me one day when I was traveling through the Everglades as Secretary of the Environment, that if Texas had been doing this with their oil, the entire world would have thought they were crazy and nobody thought we were crazy taking the very thing that our economy is based on in Florida and simply getting rid of it. And, and you, know, you, you, you mentioned the issue of the Clean Water Act. I think the Clean Water Act is a very, very important environmental law. It dates back to, to the early 70s. The modern Clean Water Act, Congress hasn't gotten around to updating it since then. But what's important to know about it is it solely fake, focuses on quality, not quantity. And you know, the idea that you could have, it was an important law in terms of improving, you know, the Cuyahoga River's not on fire anymore, but the idea that there was a time in our thinking where quantity wasn't important, only quality. And today what we know is in many ways they're inextricably linked, and yet we have been unable to change this national law so that we can actually provide safeguards against both for quality and for quantity. So let's say that we are, um, 
successful in being sustainable in this country, whatever we individually think that means. But developing a farming system that makes more sense than the one we have now, using our energy resources in the most productive and least destructive ways. Where does that leave us with regard to climate change, which is not an American issue, it's an international issue. And even if we were to do everything right, and there's a great deal of American history that says that's unlikely, um, how do we, do we just let climate change happen and then, you know, there are a lot of crazy ideas about how to mitigate thing, you know, pumping all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere, is that the answer? Because it doesn't seem realistic to think that a world is going to get together and do the sensible thing. Well, I think that um, we have to, yes, it is a global issue, and, and yes, it doesn't matter where the greenhouse gas emissions come from, they affect uh, all of us, but that doesn't remove our responsibility. True. And I think we have an important leadership uh, role to play. I think we can bring to bear important technologies that will help to reduce greenhouse gas um, emissions. I think that you know it, it, it has got to be not just a government effort, uh, an industry effort, a scientific effort. It also has to be an individual effort. And one of the things I have been struck by throughout my career in, in government is the power of access to information, that when we give individuals information, they frequently will, in fact, make a better choice. And you know, one example to, that you I have the same experience better. with good food, but good to hear. Well, <laughs> well, that's exactly right. And so when, when, when you explain to somebody that, you know, you can, um, we all learn to read the labels on cans about how many calories and salt and all those kind of things that, and we make different decisions. You may care about calories, someone else may care about salt, but we have access to But thank to God we have that information. But you know, we love it, right? And they're yes. trying to make it better and more usable. You know, imagine if you had the same information about how much energy you were using at any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't say his name because he's a well-known person and he might be embarrassed by the story, but he had an energy audit done on his house. And he found out that he has two stereo systems, right? that one uses 10 times the amount of energy as the other. And his response is, my experience of these two stereo systems is identical, right? They both play music. Now I have information, so what am I going to do? I'm going to stop using the stereo system that uses a lot of energy, and maybe I'll replace it with a more efficient one. But we haven't been willing thus far to give consumers access to information about energy use. Now, there's a lot of young companies out there starting to do it. There's one that's about to give you an app on your yeah. iPhone. So when, you know, my husband and I always have this fight, honey, turn down the air conditioner, honey, turn up the heat, whatever. I can, when I get to work and he hasn't done what he was supposed to do, go onto my iPhone and regulate <laughs> my thermostat from, you know, from, from far away. And, you know, same thing is going to happen. We're all going to have smart refrigerators. We're going to have smart cars. We're going to have smart appliances. You know, right now your refrigerator is cycling on and off all day long because it doesn't know when you open and close the door. It will learn that you only open and close the door for two hours in the morning and one hour in the evening. My refrigerator actually is slightly smart because I can press a vacation mode. When I decide to go out of town for a few weeks, I can push a button or for a day or two, and it will change its energy use. My food is all protected but it's no longer using the same amount of energy. And so it's a long way of saying, I think access to consumer information is going to be hugely important in addition to what governments need to do. I totally agree. Don't you think, and this is sort of what, Dan, what you've been talking about with water, don't you think making people pay for things in the real world, um, and now I'm thinking about a carbon tax, which has not been a successful mm -hmm. thing in this country. We don't pay the real price of lots of things we have, from a desk to the food we eat. And until we even know what the real price is, I'm not sure we can make those intelligent decisions. Right. The environmental externalities are not actually put into uh, the prices that we experience as consumers, and that would certainly make a difference. I have, you would know that. Right. I wanted to ask you about China, if I could, because you had said something that's true, that they're building a lot of coal fire plants. They're also kind of on the cutting edge of doing advanced alternative work. Yes, I think, I mean, I think their kind of motto is they're doing everything. And it goes back, um, probably not many people here read, I don't know how many of you read George W. Bush's memoirs, but in it. Don't insult us, we it, all read that. Yeah, but he has a story about, at a, he asked the president of China, what do you worry about? Because he said, I worry in the middle of the night about another terrorist attack. He said, the president of China said, I worry about these 20 million people who are moving. And because that's social stability, it's political stability, it's everything. Uh, and I think that that is 
when they look at energy, that's their fundamental starting point. But I do see some definite changes there. Uh, number one, they put efficiency at the top of their uh, own objectives because they, from their own point of view, you know, they'll probably at the end of this decade use as much oil as the United States and they could keep going. They don't want to do that. So they want to be efficient. It's hard for them because they've inherited these huge energy and efficient industries from the communist era, from the former communist centrally planned era. So they're doing that. Secondly, uh, they have, um, uh, under the new uh, five-year plan, they have all these industries, new industries that they want to be leaders in. Uh, and many of them are basically energy environment uh, uh, oriented. And I think starting around 2007, as Carol knows, they started to change what they were saying about climate change mm -hmm. and concerned about the impact. So you see a uh, process of uh, change there. And it is interesting that, you know, kind of what's happening with the electric car, different countries, you know, maybe there are four countries that are really players in it, the U.S., Japan, South Korea, and China, and they have somewhat different objectives in it. I think the U.S., it's climate, but it's also rebirth of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, China, it's, it's, I mean, they talk about climate, but I think it gets mixed in with their other problem, which is we talked about environment getting worse. In some ways, the environment's gotten better. As, mm -hmm. I mean, we have much cleaner air. They don't. That's mm -hmm. a huge problem for them. And it's a problem because everybody's breathing this really dirty air. So electric, they see an electric car as uh, answering that. Uh, they see it as answering the question of not having their oil consumption go out of control. And I think there's a third interest that they've built up this large automobile industry now, but they're unlikely to be able to catch up with uh, the established players but they see the electric car as a way to kind of do an end run mm -hmm. and sort of be at the front. So a lot of different motivations come together uh, in the way they're going forward. I, I think there's a fifth one too. I don't know if you would agree. Um, there is a, 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 a small but nevertheless growing environmental movement. And you know, if, if you think about the environmental movement, the anti-pollution movement in the United States, it was really a product of the middle class. That as you know, people came to the cities, they, they started to think about the quality of life. They had time on their hands. That you know, the nine to five workday was really a reality. They started to say, wait just a moment. We don't want this industrial pollution. We don't want this dirty water, this this dirty air. And so you know, the EPA gets created by Richard Nixon in 1970, and so on and so forth. I think you're starting to see some of that in, in China, where, and I think in part because of the one child policy, people are saying, well, I only have, you know, I, my kid needs to be safe, and I don't want my kid to experience asthma. And so as they come to the cities with all the negatives associated with coming to the cities, I also think there's this, this sort of beginning yeah. of a, a yeah. really tiny, but nevertheless potentially powerful um, environmental movement. Well, I think absolutely. If, if the quality of air, I mean, I hear it from friends who live in, you know, Chinese live in China all the time, and they're concerned, you know, about their children and right. what they're breathing. And it's interesting because for me, I remember you know, growing up in Los Angeles when the smog was really terrible. T talked about it when I was out at the, at the auto mu museum there. And you, you know, it was really painful to breathe. Well, that started a m movement. And who set up the California Air Resources Board but Ronald Reagan? And uh, started a process of regulation and have the story of the scientists in there who actually figured out where smog came from. And I think that you know, part of the, the motive force in our country from the electric vehicle basically arises from that movement in California and to want to get to a zero emissions vehicle. And it started basically in response to really terrible air pollution. Mm -hmm. I think um, I actually want to ask each one ridiculous question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Dan Barber, if you could have any one wish implemented towards making the world more sustainable. Yes. Just do it. What is it? I mean, I, look, I, I, my, my interest here is in flavor of food. And, and I know that sounds next to these two colleagues kind of trivial um, and a little elitist and uh, a feat and Eastern and all these other um, you forgot impudent. rarefied. What? You forgot impudent. <laughs> um, but, but I, I believe, and so I'm a chef and I should believe this, but I, but I, I believe it maybe even uh, you know, stronger than, than, than the next, is that I, I flavor, if you are looking for truly delicious food, I mean truly not, not, not fast food companies that tell you they make the best hamburger or the best taco, I'm talking about truly delicious food, you have behind you 
a whole host of environmental, ecological, nutritional, even community uh, activism work at hand. I mean, they're, they're the same thing. So that my, I guess my wish is for people to, to appreciate, to, uh, to celebrate uh, the, the hedonism aspect of, of delicious food because with it, uh, you know, a delicious carrot or a delicious leg of lamb has with it these, these environmental decisions, ecological, agricultural decisions that, that add up to uh, not just delicious food, but a, a delicious future. And I, I believe that very strongly. It's a small way into this issue. Uh, and it's difficult when you, when you have overriding issues like global climate change and peak oil and the rest of these uh, overbearing issues. But one thing that we can all do in this room is vote for this kind of system that I'm referring to three times a day. That's a very nice way to be in the world. How many times do we get to vote for a president? Uh, once every four years. So we get to vote three times a day for the kind of future that we want. And we are generally powerless, not to compare myself with the colleagues and, 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 and make this into more of a magisterial statement than it needs to be, but we are generally powerless to deal with a lot of the issues they're talking about. Generally speaking, of, of course, we can vote the right way uh, politically. But for the everyday, and I'm, I, I say again, three times a day, we can vote with our forks. And, I, and that's a very powerful statement. I, I said 6% as a, you know, 6% uh, of our, our food we're eating is local or regional or sustainable in, in that sense. You know, it's an amazing number considering 10 years ago. I said it before, I just stress it again. And that's basically because of people like uh, Michael Pollan and others who have, who have brought to bear this issue. And people are, are, are spending more and changing their habits because of it. I think that's a very positive uh, way to look at the future. I think you know something that Dan said a little earlier that may have gone by quickly is that uh, the food supply around the world is very much affected by what happens to the price of energy because the energy components directly and indirectly are so high. And we should remember in this discussion that what happens with energy can be disruptive not only of that. Some people think that the Arab Spring really started over the cost of food. Right. Mm -hmm. And outside the United States, people are very aware of that but also how disruptive it can be of our overall economy. And every recession since 1973 has been associated with a eruption in oil prices. And so I think there's a kind of energy security dimension we shouldn't forget. And last week, in addition to the Keystone XL decision, the other thing that came out was the United Nations uh, report on Iran's nuclear program, which was no surprise probably to any country in the region, but which did codify that I forgot whether it's 12 stages or all the steps that Iran is going through and kind of ratcheted up the tension. So should, we should remember that there's a security side of this too that can have very immediate uh, impacts on everybody's life, including their ability to actually pay for food, whatever kind of food they're, they're buying. So I guess the kind of two things that I would kind of look for if you're talking big overarching things is in addition, to the questions that I said about energy and environmental objectives is keeping the security dimension in mind. And I do think um, that you know we're twice as energy efficient as a country as we were a couple of decades ago. And I think having that as kind of part of the DNA, individuals, companies, national goals, uh, uh, our economy has grown about two and a half times during that period, uh, that, that putting the consistent emphasis on efficiency at least helps for the next 10 or 20 years to meet many of the most important uh, considerations that we have there. And it's not a penalty. It, uh, it can make us more productive. Carol, can any of this happen without a, an elected <laughs> group of officials who support it? Well, I would to go to the original question, then I'll come quickly to that. I would put a price, a cap on carbon, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I would also I'm fascinated by community and how do we form communities. And I'm particularly fascinated by young people because they're finding new ways to form community. And I think it's in communities where there are shared values that we actually generate change. Um, and whether it's, you know, you know, I don't know about how many, we're 
sort of all contemporaries, I don't keep in touch with anybody I went to high school with because that involved writing a letter and putting it in an envelope and putting a stamp on it and mailing. Uh, young people today are in touch with people they haven't seen in 10 years because there are mechanisms for doing that. But So it, it, it's this idea of giving people access to, to, to community, creating communities that will then allow them to make informed decisions and quality decisions uh, about the food they eat, about how they, they live their lives, the kind of transportation. Um, they, they, they use. You know, yes, it does require a certain type of, of um, elections are important. Participating in our small d democratic process is, is hugely important. Um, my husband served in Congress from the time he was 25. He was elected and left after 18 years. Actually, the voters asked him to leave after 18 years. It happens. Um, but the, in, the reason I mentioned this is when he was first elected in 1974, it cost about $60,000 to run for a congressional seat in New York, so an, an expensive state uh, for elections at the time. Today, it cost about $3 million. Uh, that's to run for a House seat. And in many contested House seats, what the candidates spend this year will not even be the big expense. It will be the outside groups because of the Supreme Court decision. Right. And I worked in Congress, and I've been around politicians for a long time, and I guess I'm sort of one. But what's happened is because of this need to raise money, to stay in office, they have to go home. They can no longer form relationships with their colleagues like they used to do. They used to be able to hang out on the weekends. They used to be able to you know, play cards together, go hunting, do whatever it is they did. And when you have relationships, as we all know, that's what gives you the opportunity to solve complicated problems. They no longer, most of the people I know who serve in Congress, no longer are able to form those relationships because they're simply not here. They're at home. They're out doing the fundraising it takes to stay in office. And I, and I think you know we've been all watching the super committee. And you know, what appears to be happening, we only have the news reports, is that they can't even seem to figure out how to have the kind of dialogue that will allow them to reach some sort of common ground. And so you know, if I had one big, big wish is that we could return to a time when there really was a civil discourse in this country and where people could find common ground. And that means forming the communities and the relationships that allow us to solve problems. So at this point, um, we could take some questions, and I think there are mics strategically. Uh, okay. Wow. I get Go to ahead. Be the first person. All right. You are. What an honor. Because I got in so late, I got to sit at the seat right by the mic. Uh, thanks so much for your very uh, informative and insightful dialogue. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. My question really is for Dan, but anybody who has thoughts on it, I've Which Dan? Them. Uh, <laughs> or Dan, but for you too, if you would like. Um, you know, Americans are eating more animal products per capita than we ever have in our history. We eat more animal products per capita than almost any nation in the entire world. And we see the results of it with public health problems, obviously the environmental problems. The UN says that animal agribusiness is one of the biggest causes of climate change. Why is there not so much discussion, do you think, on just encouraging people, let's say, to eat a more plant-centered diet, to eat more plants and fewer animals? It seems like it would be a great way to prevent some of our public health crises, environmental problems, and prevent a whole staggering amount of animal cruelty as well. Well, uh, I think there has been a lot of talk about it, but, but probably not enough. And it's probably more to your point um, that we could solve a lot if we, we ate lower on the food chain. Uh, it's very expensive to eat meat, although that's not reflected at the checkout aisle, of course. So, so and, and, and as I was saying before, I think it will be, uh, maybe in our lifetime. Anyway, uh, though I would be just a bit careful about it uh, from some of the perspectives that you mentioned, because look, I'm coming from the Hudson Valley. And the Hudson Valley um, is a very difficult place to grow vegetables and fruits. Um, almost impossible in most of the Hudson Valley to grow grains, which is really what we eat. And when we talk about the, 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 the most exciting social movement, we talk about fruits and vegetables, it's like, it's like nothing. You know? We eat grain, we eat wheat uh, for the most part. I mean, 80% of our farmland in this country is in grains. Um, that's that's the, the big issue. The problem is that 80%, that of the 80%, something like 60% go to feed animals. That's a very inefficient system. So I agree with you. We need to eat less meat. But, but in the Hudson Valley, you know, to, if, you, if you believe in, in a localized food system, and I really do, from the economic standpoint, from the health 
standpoint, from the nutrition standpoint, from the, from the taste standpoint. Uh, you've got to look at the full life cycle of, of an animal to start recommending diets for people. And if you're going to look at the full life cycle of an animal in the Hudson Valley, it's actually quite cheap to raise meat in the Hudson Valley. You've got great grass, amazing grass. You can do a lot with animals in the harsh conditions of the winter, uh, both haying fields in the summer, storing that and feeding them at a very low energy cost, at a very low economic cost. It's, it's low hanging fruit. Look, the Hudson Valley was built on, on dairy. I mean, that's what built the, the beautiful, iconic landscapes. Um, we ought to maybe take advantage of that more, not less, uh, for the future. I'm only using, and there are not a ton of people that live in the Hudson Valley, so I'm not extrapolating this example to, to say that we should all be eating more grass-fed and grass-finished local meat because the Hudson Valley's ecological conditions suggest that we should be raising cows there and not carrots and cabbages. Because we shouldn't be raising carrots and cabbages there. Ec economically, I can tell you that it's very hard to do. Uh, and the land is begging for the low-hanging fruit, which is animals. So in fact, to answer your question, and I, I, I say it a little controversially because I, uh, because I want to make the point is we should be eating more meat if you're <laughs> from there. Uh, more meat. You should be eating more meat that's local, that's fed on grass. You should be eating different parts of the animal, not just the loin and the, and the steaks. You should be able to encourage chefs to be cooking all parts of the animal. Uh, and you should be eating it in a way that, that supports your local ecology and supports the open space and the landscape. If you're in Berkeley or you're in San Diego, Southern California, and you want to be a vegetarian, you should be. <laughs> I, I really think you should be, because the ecology is telling you that's what it should be. So my, my overall point to you is, I don't know that we should be giving a prescription about what our diet should be on, on, on a national scale, and certainly not on a global scale. Uh, we should, in fact, do what the Native American Indians did so brilliantly, which was ask the ecological conditions, what should we be growing? And then base our diet on that microclimate. Uh, I think that's the future of eating because it's the least expensive and it's the most energy efficient and it's absolutely the most delicious. Um, hi, uh, great panel. Uh, with the uh, failure of the climate legislation, one thing I've thought about is um, can we get pieces of a solution through? Um, I, I don't. I have some familiarity in the transportation sector, don't know as much about others, but I'm wondering if we can't cobble together things that are, together would get you mm -hmm. the kinds of numbers. And I'll give you two examples in transportation, and I'm sure there's lots of others in other parts, other sectors of the economy. Um, we now provide uh, a parking, uh, employers can uh, deduct parking benefits to their employees, and most employees 90 plus percent get free parking, there's no requirement that they have to give their employees the option for cash in lieu of parking. And that seems to be a very common sense um, a, approach. You get a 12 percent reduction in drive alone to work. Mm -hmm. The second uh, one is we require in most, in all, all but one state, auto insurance. Um, if you, Brookings did a major study, if you required or had that insurance <coughs> offered on a per mile basis, you'd have an 8% reduction in driving. So we've done a good job on the vehicle side of it. Uh, I know there's been research in utilities and how to be smart meters, and there's actually some more activity going on because there was some, uh, some things in the stimulus bill. I'm just wondering if, if we can't cobble together a package of a lot of these kinds of measures that might get reductions similar to the numbers of um, of the failed legislation. Thank you. So I think the answer is, is absolutely yes. And I, I actually think that the, 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 the era of, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 pages of legislation is over. I think we, we, we saw that uh, at the end of, of the health care uh, de debate. And that what you could do is take discernible parts of a clean energy economy, of a clean energy future, and, and, and offer them. So you could have a renewable electricity standard or a clean energy standard. You could have transportation requirements. You could have energy efficiency requirements. You could have building construction requirements. Uh, so, and, and you might you might actually be able to form different coalitions of support. So somebody who could support might not support an, a clean energy standard would support a building efficiency. Um, standard. I also think, as I said at the beginning, you know, the, the administration has a set of executive authorities, you know, existing authorities on the book, which if they take full advantage of, will achieve significant changes. So, it, and I think they will stay the course, for example, on setting a, a 54, 55 mile per gallon car. 
and what that will do is actually create new technology opportunities and with that will you know with that certainty that car companies are going to have to look at new technologies you'll create an investment opportunity for some of these smaller companies who are looking at battery technology and, and, and sort of other um, solutions you know someone did a, a study of the Clean Air Act recently where they looked at what it cost industry to reduce its pollution and what the benefits writ large to to American society was and uh, the cost uh, were essentially a dollar and the benefits thirty dollars and so what we've learned is through government action and through government regulation not just government financial support but actually through government uh, requirements we're able to stimulate uh, large-scale investments that create you know jobs here uh, in the United States and can bring us you know cleaner air or, or cleaner water um, and so yes I think your, your observation is exactly right I think we have time for a couple more questions and then there's going to be a reception and an opportunity for anyone to acquire Daniel's book <laughs> and you should do that I should, um, I should hold it up. go ahead <laughs> wait 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 Speak into that machine. I agree that you establish your vote as a consumer uh, by purchasing, but how do you become a stakeholder when you choose not to purchase? When you choose that you should purchase less, or you should not have something, you somehow lose that vote. And, and what would be the, you mean, how do you do that with food, though? Because then you don't eat. Yeah. But if you eat less, if you, you eat, don't eat meat, as the other person mentioned. Um, OK. So, so this, I want to make sure I understand this. You're, you're saying, I, my point was, you can affect change in the way that you want by voting with your fork and spending your dollars. OK, you agree with that, but you're saying then? How do you become a stakeholder when you're just a non-voter because you don't purchase, or you choose to purchase less because we consume too much? And, and cut down on the purchases, mm -hmm. right? It's a good question. Uh, but the answer still, I mean, it's a, it's a little straightforward, but I think the, the answer still is that, is that with the limited amount of money that you're choosing to spend towards your diet, you're spending it very wisely. Um, and so what's wisely? For me, wisely is you're looking for the greatest nutrient density in what you're eating. You better, because if you're going to eat less, you better make those calories count. And the true nutrient density comes from soils that are, uh, that are made fertile uh, without synthetic fuels. Uh, they are the most healthy, usually, uh, when they don't have to travel long distances and have a lot of frequent flyer miles attached to their, <laughs> to their calories. So, so you are generally, even if you're spending less, if you are spending wisely, and again, I don't think spending wisely, you have to be like a, 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 you know, a, 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 a monkish in the, in the pejorative sense. I mean, in the, in the, you, know, uh, uh, you don't have to refuse the pleasures of food. You can actually spend less and increase the value of the experience of eating. And I, and I, I agree with the increase the value of a community around a table with shared costs. Eating less and eating lower on the food chain does not mean less delicious. If you're smart about it, I think you can, you can use those dollars very wisely and support a local food economy that, that is more than subsisting. Okay. Room, okay. Two more, mm. and then we can consume food. Why is <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting discussion. I want to return to the issue of externalities. Uh, you know, we focus a lot on global warming when we talk about the externalities of carbon-based fuels. And we don't, I don't think we focus enough on the healthcare effects of, of carbon-based fuels. The externalities of, when you talk about global warming, are hard to measure, uh, are, are very far, in some cases could be very far away, whereas the healthcare costs, even by the very own calculations of the government, uh, you know, for instance, on the couple of rules coming up, are as much as $100 billion a year. And just one other thought before I ask my question, which is that, you know, we talk about making solar you know, competitive with, say, coal right now, and the cost has to come down. So my question really is, is like, if the external healthcare costs of carbon-based fuels were actually built into the cost of that, would it already be competitive? Would solar already be competitive? Yeah, would it, and, and alternatives. Which, which, when you say the external costs, Well, for instance, the MACT rule, which is about to come up, the maximum it's control the technology on, the and, on coal plants. Right. Which, if you know, uh, Carol Brown had just talked about closing 20, 30 plants. So you know, many of them would be closed right away, or they would be closed a lot faster if they were required to put in maximum control technology. That will cost some billions Less of dollars. Happen. But what never gets calculated into the cost is the fact that 17,000 people a year die 
uh, prematurely because of particulate pollution caused uh, by those plants, uh, that there are hundreds of thousands of additional asthma cases every year. These are costs that are passed along to all of us in the form of higher health care insurance bills and higher Medicare and higher Medicaid bills. And the uh, carbon-based fuels never pick up those costs. And, I, you know, we never talk about it in that way. And, I, you know, we talk, you talk about the cap mm -hmm. on global warming, but whereas <coughs> the real issues are in some ways closer to home, it seems to me. So I, I think this, th there's a bit of a debate going on in Washington right now. It's a little bit, I think, below the radar screen, but it's this whole issue of cost-benefit analysis, and I think that's part of what you're, you're, you're speaking to, which is should agencies like EPA be limited in the decisions they make based on whether or not the benefits to society exceed the cost of reducing uh, pollution. Now, I, I, I litigated this question, uh, a decision I made at EPA was litigated all the way to the Supreme Court on this very question, and I prevailed in my argument that no, the law didn't require me to limit my public health decisions in terms of setting an ozone standard or the first ever fine particle um, standard to a, to a cost-benefit analysis. And you're exactly right. We should be embedding these, but I just want to be clear that if, the, if it changing, shifting the decision-making, the policy decision-making paradigm to a cost-benefit analysis would be, a, I think, a very bad thing for our country. Because what has happened historically is when we first look at reducing a pollutant and we look at the cost associated to that, we have no way of factoring in American innovation and ingenuity. And so we overestimate what it will actually cost to achieve a pollution reduction. We similarly do not appreciate all of the benefits. You talked about asthma cases avoided, premature deaths avoided. But you know, what is the, what, what is the lost work days associated with the mom or the dad who has to take that child uh, to, the, to the emergency room? And, and you know, one of the reasons we've made real progress on clean air is because we've been willing to say that it's not going to be about the cost. It's going to be about clean air, it's going to be about the science, it's going to be about the benefits that, that we provide. And so you know, it's, 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 it, you're raising an important point about how we actually embed these in, in, in the decisions we make, but we shouldn't limit the decisions we make when it comes to setting public health air or water pollution standards to an economic cost-benefit analysis. One last question, ma'am. Yes, great discussion. Um, I'm interested in the interest of not being too elitist, um, looking at the um, way to expand um, this access, Dan, to, to healthful food and everything, given what we've talked about as these increasing costs as we're all going forward in, in terms of energy and water, et cetera, all those inputs. Um, and I would be interested to hear yours and possibly Carol's um, ideas about possible policy mechanisms that could improve access for more people to this sort of food, and I'm including urban agriculture, and also changes to the industrial agriculture system. Why don't Thanks. you start with the policy? Uh. Um, you know, I, I, I'll tell a, a quick story. When I was at EPA now 10, 12 years ago, one of the things I attempted to do was regulate the waste from what are called CAFAs, or combined animal feeding, um, operations, these very, very large, as, as Dan has talked about, industrial. And one, some of the, the response I got from some in the industry, in the CAFO industry, was, well, it's just animal waste. And at one point I realized that one of these CAFOs was actually going to produce more waste, more manure, than a small city would produce. And I thought, could you imagine if EPA <laughs> decided not to regulate the, solid, the, 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 the waste water from a city? People would think we'd have lost our mind, and why, you know, waste is waste, and, and, and shouldn't we uh, be about uh, regulating it? And, and I think that you know, there are ways to, to look at these kind of, of regulations that will cause the industry to have to, to think differently. But it's, it's a very inefficient tool in most instances for the kind of, of a, if, if, if the outcome you want is sustainable agriculture, trying to use is existing regulatory tools, I think will be a very challenged uh, and, and, and arduous uh, 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 process. I think, you know, going back to what Dan and I have talked about, I think in terms of community and, 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 and really looking at what is it that the land uh, in, your, in your community can actually provide you is, is a far more sensible and practical way to proceed. I'm glad, I'm glad. 
Carol said that because I, I, I do think there's some levers to pull, uh, especially with the farm bill, which, which is another. being debated right now, actually, without our knowing what, what they're talking about. Uh, and it's going to be decided without our knowing uh, or being able to, to uh, affect the process intelligently, uh, which is really too bad because a lot of what's written uh, to your question about access and about availability actually about the entire food chain uh, is in that legislation. So it, that, that's, that's unfortunate, and, um, and I, I don't think it's going to change now. We'll have, as, you know, fight the fight in another five years, or they always say that. Five years from now, we're really going to have the food system we want from this. But, and I, don't, I agree. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I think the thing you learn from, the, that we all learned from, from, from Obama was this is like, this is bottom up. This is bottom His election is bottom up. This food movement is bottom up. It's not going to come from the top. Uh, it's going to come from all of us demanding the kind of food we want for ourselves and for our children. And I, I, I go back to Carol's point about community. And I, one of the great unfortunate uh, uh, problems when it relates to food with this issue is that we don't, we Americans, don't have a cultural a culture around great food. That's we so do not. Uh, we never have. We don't ha actually have a culture around great farming and agriculture. This is one of the great lies. The Jefferson Yeoman farmer is a myth. It was true for wet agriculture in like 13 colonies. And west of the Mississippi, small land yeoman farmer thing makes no sense. There's no water for it to begin with. Uh, so our whole agriculture tradition uh, is, is, is bad agriculture. And our whole cultural tradition in terms of great food comes from other cultures, is borrowed from other cultures, um, which, which we've done quite well. But unfortunately, we've, we've borrowed the, the celebratory foods and, and not the food, not the everyday foods. And, and so we have an obesity epidemic in part because of it. I, I just, I, 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 I want to make sure we end here on a hopeful note. Um, uh, and say that, that um, I do believe that, that you look at a Bill Gates vision of the future and, and, and a CAFO vision of the future, and what you see, in my mind, is like the old factories billowing the black smoke in the 18th century, you know, in the, the New England, the, the England, English Revolution. You know, those, are, those feel very heavy now. They feel very old. And though there are a lot of interesting people talking about that as a vision for the future, it's, it's, I don't think it's the way uh, we're going to head. I, I do believe that this regional, local idea, while sounding quaint, especially when I say it, uh, mm -hmm. is, is actually going to be very innovative. And if you look at some brilliant farmers that are taking advantage of, of energy exchange on the farm between animals and vegetables, mm -hmm. pr principally creating uh, uh, these free energies that are there, photosynthesis and energies from the waste of animals. You have a, a resilient food system and a much more delicious one, and I believe in our lifetime we'll be eating more of that, and our Thanksgiving table will be more delicious. <laughs> one last word from Bill. Sure. Uh, you know, when I was, uh, those who've written books, I know Steve Cole has, uh, probably the hardest thing to write at the end is the conclusion, because you have to say, you know, you have to sum it up and say, what does it mean for your readers who mm -hmm. spent this time with you, and what does it mean for yourself? And so I spend a lot of time on the quest thinking about the conclusion. And I think it also ends on a hopeful note. Uh, I hope a realistic note, because you, you know, when you look at the energy side of things, you see there are a lot of risks there, ranging from environmental to geopolitical, and we could just go through many others. But uh, the, the hope is the fact that we've had this great revolution that started in the 18th century in terms of harnessing technology. And what Carol is talking about, I think, is really uh, central which is this notion that, you know, there's no reason that innovation's going to end. Innovation doesn't exist in a vacuum. It responds to needs, and I think the needs have been uh, uh, identified pretty clearly. And innovation in energy takes longer than other fields. It's not like Twitter or uh, <laughs> YouTube, uh, because, and I think so often, you know, uh, Silicon Valley went into energy in a big way in 2004, and then found out it takes longer takes a lot of capital and there's a lot of regulation. It's not like starting Twitter. But uh, on the other hand, what we do have, so it takes longer to unfold, but one of the things we have going for us, I think, is uh, we talk a lot about globalization, but we're seeing a globalization of innovation. It's not just centered in this country. It's centered in also in those countries that you talk about that are the large consumers, and they are also caught up in this process. And so I think on that kind of positive note, uh, saying, you know, we're going to, there are going to be surprises. We can't say the timing. And we're going to see the adaptation of technology. Just on the energy front now, we see there are major things that are changing in energy, the result of innovation. So I think that um, also, to end, uh, 
like to say, <laughs> ending on a hopeful note. So I don't know about you, but I feel very privileged to have been here to listen to three extremely innovative people. Talk. Now you're all entitled to buy books and drink. <laughs>